Okay, welcome everyone. Welcome back. This is the second week of the WIC webinar. Uh, we are doing this introduction to using the WIC model with NASA Earth Science Observations. Um, last week, uh, we had an overview of the model itself, especially model features and the processes that go behind the model. Uh, today now we are going to talk about overview of remote sensing based input data for WIC. Kale Marker in detail explained um, what requirements are there for different processes and this week what we are going to do is try and see how to get some of those data from remote sensing so that if you want to set up WIC for your own river basin how would you get the data, where would you get the, get the data, and how would you prepare them uh, for big modeling. And then next week again, uh, same time, we will have an overview of implementation of this data into WIC model and then look at the output. And as we mentioned last week, our case study is going to be uh, the Mekong River Basin. And uh, we're going to focus on uh, today what we're going to focus on is um, 2017 July-August flooding that occurred in uh, Mekong. And so we will demonstrate how to get data for that flooding event. But for your use, you can, you can use this presentation as a reference and set up week for your own region. So that is the idea behind this presentation. That's the overall goal. Again, just briefly, this is the RSET website and webinar page where you can find all the slides and recordings of the presentations. You will also have homework on RSET website. And this uh, answers to this uh, homework uh, can be submitted via Google form. Uh, the due date for homework is 16th of March. And so those who attend all the webinars and submit the homework, will receive um, a certificate of completion in a couple of months after the webinar is done. So with that, we're going to start today's session. We will have first overview of remote sensing based input data for WIC. So we will see exactly what data are required in what form. And then we will go back and look at what Earth observations are there, which provide these data either directly or indirectly. And then we will have a demonstration of how to access this data uh, and how to prepare, how to get this for a uh, region of interest, in this case, the Mekong Basin. So we'll start with a brief overview of the WIC inputs. And again, this is uh, for your reference. In addition to what Kale had last week, these are uh, websites where you can find WIC documentation and um, especially documentation about inputs, which has all the details uh, that we recommend that you go through if you, uh, when you are ready to uh, download and run the model or set up the model for your own use. So here is a list of input requirements for a week. As we saw last week, uh, these are the input parameters. Um, in, they are provided in different files, global parameter file, then meteorological forcing, which is the most required and dynamic forcing, which, which represents weather um, for the model, uh, soil parameters, vegetation parameters, and library and elevation data. So all these data sets are available from NASA satellite observations, and some are available from Earth system models, which use NASA satellite data and assimilate into the model. So what we're going to see is that how, uh, which satellites and which model to use to get these input parameters. Before that, here is a brief overview of all the input data. Global parameters, um, they are given, each slide will have reference that you can go to and, and look at the details of these parameters and input uh, requirements. But basically, this is the file that's the main input file. It specifies locations of other input and output data files, uh, start and end of the model simulation, how to uh, parameters that govern the model simulation, 
And uh, something to note is the model mode. Uh, it's physical processes options. So model mode, um, as uh, you will see next week, and as Kale mentioned earlier, um, there are two modes. At the water balance mode, one is energy balance mode. And now in, in water balance mode, we need daily data, whereas energy balance mode, we do need sub-daily data. So for this case study, we are going to focus on the water balance mode, but global parameter file is the one where you would specify which mode you are using, and based on that, you will have your input data prepared for the simulation. On the right-hand side, you, just an example, when you go to this website, each and every parameter that you require is defined um, in, in this. And here on the left-hand side, you, will, you see a C code example. There is this file in which you can go and, and change um, what you need to for your own simulation. So specifically, not going into great detail, but global parameters, they define all uh, simulations, uh, main simulation parameters, energy balance parameters, soil, precipitation, surface fluxes, metallurgical forcing desegregation parameters, um, and then other processes which are controlled. They're all defined in this as well as where the output and input files are. Those, so this is a very important file for input. Next is soil parameters. This also is a top file in the sense that it assigns ID for each grid cell of your simulation. As Kay mentioned, WIC is a grid-based model. And so each model has latitude, longitude, and so each grid cell is assigned an ID, and so it, re it is referred to as that ID in the model. Um, also, it defines soil hydrologic and thermal uh, properties and parameters for each grid cell, and then defines initial soil moisture conditions. Uh, that is derived from um, climatological precipitation conditions, as we will see uh, later. Soil data, uh, because we said that soil characteristics they depend on what kind of soil it is, the pH level, um, water storage capa capacity, um, what kind of um, clay fraction. So these are the lime and gypsum content. So there are multiple parameters which control soil characteristics. And globally, these data are provided by Food and Agricultural Organizations, or FAO. And there's a link provided here. So these are static data that you would specify in your model once. And also, there is um, a website or where these data are uh, archived. They are called Harmonized World Database, or HWSD. Uh, just a schematic is shown here. Um, the data are available in raster form at one kilometer or 30 arc second resolution. So this data from this uh, website you can download on your computer if they are in TIFF format and then you can click to the shape file of your watershed or river basin according to your need but so these data are very important and they are static you don't change it uh, during your uh, simulation this is just an example of the map um, the numbers that you will see in this data set they, so there is a code which deciphers what, what each of these numbers mean. It has to do with soil characteristics and properties. And this is the Mekong Basin. Uh, the HWSD data are clipped to this basin for the model simulation that we are going to do. Next, we have meteorological forcing parameters. Again, um, the references given here, or website given here, they have information about you know, these inputs. Um, this requires daily data because we are going to run this model in water balance mode. We will have, we need minimum surface air temperature, so daily minimum and maximum surface air temperatures, precipitation, and surface wind speed. So these are par weather parameters which are very important and weak response to that. Uh, response to that. Uh, we need annual mean precipitation at each grid point, and this is for specifying initial soil moisture condition. 
which also provides a very important boundary. A uh, number of hydrologic characteristics are controlled by how much soil moisture already is there. So this is an important parameter. Now, some daily data, we are not going to use it, but they are available from the same site that we are going to talk about. And uh, they are needed for big simulation if you want to use complete energy balance mode. Vegetation parameters, they are also available from remote sensing. And the, what we need is land cover, uh, vegetation class, fraction of grid covered by vegetation. Um, there is leaf area index and shortwave albedo. Albedo is nothing but the reflected sunlight, and this is in shortwave band. Um, and there are some more parameters. I, they are either um, they are region dependent or situation dependent, and they are not derived from remote sensing. They are just specified. So root zone, depth, and distribution, that is uh, depending on each region. And there is some information already. Um, if you read the documentation, you will know some information already in the file or in the database that you can use. Height of surface wind, where you are specifying your wind, that is important. Um, it's either 2 meters or 10 meters, depending on how and where you get the wind near the surface. And vegetation roughness, this also depends on region, what kind of vegetation that is. And so these are. Uh, it, the schemes are there in the model to have these. But top parameters, they're all available from remote sensing. Vegetation library just supplements the vegetation parameter uh, file. And it actually parameterization for all land and vegetation classes are defined in here. Um, as Kale mentioned um, just last week, is that WIC model has uh, Highest resolution it can work with is about three kilometers. But within that grid, you can have number of land and vegetation classes, as well as elevation bands. And so there is a subgrid scale parameterization going on. Then finally, it's um, averaged or added to the grid level information. So in this library, you would specify uh, parameterization for all land and vegetation classes within each grid. Next, we talk about elevation data. These are also important for, uh, especially for um, flooding is one thing. Another is to, to specify or to decide where there is snow. Um, so um, it is optional, because if you don't specify uh, high resolution elevation data or bands, then mean elevation data are used for any grid that you use. But if you specify elevation bands within each grid, then WIC uh, treats each band separately um, and treats uh, if it is elevated and it's um, colder than certain temperature, then it's treated as a snow band. So it is useful for snow model uh, and improving performance uh, representing snow accumulation in mountainous region. So although this is optional parameter, it is quite useful. And this is also available from remote sensing. So with that, we saw what are the main input parameters that we are supposed to provide for WIC simulation. And now we are going to go through a list of these data that are available from NASA observations. OK. So here is what we talked about. We talked about input data, and these are the sources for the data. We talked about meteorological forcing, for which we need temperatures and winds at surface. We need precipitation. Um, and these are available from these two sources. MERA 2, which is modern era retrospective analysis for research and application. So MERA provides assimilated data, and that provides temperature and winds. And we will see that in a demo. Uh, there is precipitation that's available from a recent satellite, which is Global Precipitation Measurement Mission, or GPM. And the precipitation product it's known as iMERGE, as we will see in the in next few slides. These are available uh, on not only daily basis, they're available in near real time. 
next, uh, there are vegetation data. So we need land cover. We need leaf area index or LAI and albedo. These are available from two satellites, Terra and Aqua, and the instrument is called MODIS, uh, that uh, moderate resolution imaging spectroradiometer that provides all these parameters. Uh, and last but not the least is elevation. Uh, elevation is available from shuttle radar topography mission, and we will see how that in a few minutes as well. Here is what um, I want to point, point out. On our set website, there is a um, pre-recorded webinar on satellites, sensors, and Earth system models for water resources management. If you want more detail about any of these satellites or sensors uh, or models, uh, this is the webinar to review again. And so here we are briefly going to mention everything. But if you want details, you can go back and look at this webinar. So we are going to start with MERA2, uh, model assimilated data. So what is MERA2? MERA2 is a Earth system model. It's called Goddard Earth Observing System, or GEOS model. And this model, it blends a large quantity of observational data from in situ sources and mainly from satellites. As you can see, these panels show here how in different years satellite coverage of the Earth or observations change. And the current is like almost everywhere we have satellite coverage. So these data are appropriately assimilated in the GEOS model. And um, model is simulated or analysis performed. So you can get um, weather and climate parameters from MERA2 the state-of-the-art model, and it focuses on hydrologic cycle. And the goal is to get a proper representation of all the water um, balance parameters. So this, is, this model is used for our meteorological forcing, especially winds and surface temperature. This is the site um, where data can be accessed. It is through. Um, NASA chest disk. We're going to have a short demo at the end, so I will not spend a lot of time. But this is the reference where you can go to this link and find MERA2 datasets uh, on this chest disk site. Okay. Now, when you want to use MERA2, we decided that you should give information about file name convention. As when you go to the website, you will see that you will see long file names with either strings or numbers. And so usually the way it goes is it is run ID, collection, dimensions, group, horizontal and vertical resolution, and timestamp. So these are all described here. So in collection, it could be constant. So it's time independent. It could be instantaneous, time average, statistics, or it could be one, three, six hours daily, monthly, or monthly diurnal, or it could be just uh, no, it's no time dependency. So that is uh, described in collection. It could be two or three dimensional. It could be just one level near the surface or at certain height, or it could be a whole profile. So that's the dimension part. Horizontal and vertical gridding is uh, Native resolution is 5 eighths by half degree, so it is 0.5 by 0.685 degree. And then vertical resolution is some parameters are horizontal only. Some are given at pressure levels. Some are given at pressure layer mean location. So this is some details. But when you go to a file name, all these you will see, and this is how you will interpret. And timestamp is just for which the data are for year, month, and day. More importantly, there are groups of data. And you can see, when you go to the data file, you will see group as A and A here will be like analysis products. You will have assimilated data, aerosol mixing, and et cetera, et cetera. You have land surface variables. So there are a number of groups. What we want to point out here is that ASM or assimilated state 
is what you access for two meter winds, which are near surface winds, and they form input to WIG model. Another thing to notice is SLV or single level. These, um, so when you, when you search for data, you would be focusing on MERA2 ASM data or SLV data. SLV data are for near surface minimum and maximum temperatures. So that brings us to next uh, parameter, and that is precipitation. So again, you will find more information on this webinar. But briefly, global precipitation measurement mission was, um, is, is a recent satellite launched in 2014, February. But importantly, this is really a follow-up mission to a long-lasting uh, mission, Tropical Rainfall Measuring Mission, or TRIM. Um, have you heard of GPM and TRIM? Um, if you have, and if you have used precipitation data, it would be great if you can just uh, write or type in the Q&A chat box so we know that you have used some of these satellite data. Okay, so as uh, we were saying, SHIM and GPM, they were both dedicated to precipitation. And they both um, are low inclination satellites. So you can see TRIM only covered tropical uh, region, but GPM can provide data in mid-latitude, about 65 south to 65 north. And it provides 16 orbits per day as shown here. And there are two sens uh, sensors, GPM microwave imager and dual precipitation radar. These are the sensors that, that actually uh, observe uh, hydrometeor or rain within the atmosphere. What is important to know is that GPM core satellite, which was launched in 2014 with GMI and BPR, is part of a bigger constellation. Uh, there are other national and international satellites listed here from uh, U.S., from Japan, from European Space Agency, from Indo-French um, agencies. So all, and so, so NOAA, NPP and NPOS are from NOAA. So all these satellites, they form a constellation along with um, GPM. Um, and so final product that is coming out of this is integrated multi-satellite retrievals for GPM or iMERGE. It combines GMI and DPR measurements, calibrates all other satellite sensors, and comes up with a rain product that is also finally calibrated with rain gauges on the land surface areas. And so the advantage of this is that GPM has 16 days, 16 orbits per day, but with all other constellations, it has a good coverage, temporal coverage. And so there are multiple iMERGE products available. In near real time, uh, there is about five hour latency, but this data can be used for monitoring flash flooding or modeling flash flooding. Uh, late data, which have 15 hour latency, and then the final, which is three month late latency, but it has uh, rain gauge data assimilated, and this is a research quality data. Um, all these file, all these data are available half hourly and at one tenth of a degree resolution, and they cover a big chunk of uh, the Earth. So it's good to monitor and anywhere you want to use WIC model, you can use GPM data. So data are available at multiple time steps, but native resolution is half hour. So it provides good coverage of precipitation systems. And getting GPM iMERGE data, this is the uh, precipitation measurement mission data access page. Um, there is a link to get data. There's a quickly takes you to iMERGE page, and we will see later that once you go to iMERGE page, there are multiple ways you can download the data. Um, and for more information and training, uh, there is a 
link here where you can go to see how to access the data. So again, this is when you go to the data access page, you will be able to see multiple options. We will look at one option, how to get this data and how to subset the data. But it's easy to, again, to use uh, GISTIS, just as Mera also is available from GISTIS, GPM iMERGE also is now available, and you can use that uh, from um, that website. Again, uh, GPM iMERGE file convention also is, uh, looks complicated, but once you know it's explanatory, um, this is the space-time average data. This is half-hourly multi-satellite merged product. Is That's what it means. This is the algorithm name. This is the day, start time, and end time. Um, this is um, minute of day for which the data are. This is the algorithm version. Um, newer versions keep coming out when the data algorithms are improved and improved data come out. So it is a good idea to check version as well. And this is the format of the data. So whenever you go to these websites to get the data, you will see long file names. And you can go back to this presentation and see uh, what the file names mean. OK, so we saw so now we have meteorological forcing uh, from MERA to NGPM. Now we're focusing on land cover, so vegetation data, land cover, uh, leaf area index, and albedo. They come from Terra and Aqua modes. So Terra and Aqua, uh, these satellites, uh, they have been flying for long term, uh, 1999 and 2002 respectively. They have multiple sensors, but modes is one of the most used sensors to provide one or two observations per day. Um, so has wide swath for good coverage. And resolution is uh, medium resolution, uh, 250 meters, 500 meters, and 1 kilometer, depending on which bands. There are multiple bands observing land and atmosphere. Uh, data are available, some on daily, 8-day, 16-day, monthly. Um, these are different temporal resolutions for different data sets. And then they're all in HDF format. These are just um, information about MODIS bands. But MODIS provides um, products, land cover, LAI, and Albedo. And these are the product names. If you go to the land processing DAC website here, you will see that um, it has a product table. And so each product description and how it is named is provided in the table. We're going, to, we're going to get land cover from something called MCD12Q1. MCD stands for MODIS combined from Terra and Aqua. So both satellite instruments are used. Um, this is just the name of the number of the product. Um, and they all have different solutions, as you can see. Uh, land cover is 500 meter monthly, and WIC requires annual mean. A leaf area index and shortwave albedo are one kilometer and five meter, 500 meters respectively with eight day, 16 day resolution, temporal resolutions. And WIC requires monthly data averaged over long term. So these are the requirements. And then MODIS file names are usually product name, MCD. Uh, if it is MOD, it's Terra, MYD is Aqua. Year usually. And then given Julian day, days are given in Julian day, so it's a day of year. Um, this is the version number. H and V represent horizontal and vertical tile number because MODIS data are available in 10 degree by 10 degree tiles. Uh, data format, and this is the this is just the information when the data were acquired or pro produced by LPDAC. So this is, this is very important for product, and this is for which time it is representing, and this is the location. So MODIS land cover data are available from, um, we'll see NASA Earth data. And then there are multiple ways, multiple schemes are used. 
but we are going to use IGBP or International Geophysics Biophysics um, Processing um, Scheme that we will use. And how, when you look at the data, different pixel value will give you different types of land cover. This is just an example of Mekong Basin land cover. Um, it's, it is IGBP based on MCD 12Q1. Similarly, LAI is obtained from MODIS. Um, on the LPDAC, there is a documentation available which tells you how to interpret the values. And there is a scale factor you always remember when you use the, uh, the value. It also has description of um, other, such as land cover assigned for urban or built up area or uh, for snow and ice. So it, it is very helpful to have this table when you start looking at the data. Again, this is an example of um, LAI over Mekong. And similarly, short wave albedo also from uh, MODIS. And then here is the scale factor. Data you get are about, they are exactly 1,000 times more than they should be. So it's a scale data. So always uh, go through the documentation. And uh, most information, in, most important information we have tried to provide here. So you can go back and review uh, this presentation as well to see what needs to be done. And here is just an example of short wave albedo um, up to it's about 30, about 3% um, overall uh, maximum value. So you can see um, these data. Next is the how to get this data. And we will have a short demo. But Earth, NASA Earth data is the site uh, to get MODIS data. And it guides you through special and temporal selection and then downloading data uh, by using this site. So this is the address to go to to um, get MODIS data. You search by MODIS product name, such as MCD12Q1, and it comes up with the data, data granule list in the lower part. You also need to know about a MODIS key projection tool. This is um, because most MODIS data are in uh, sinusoidal, format, so equal grid area are there. They're not in exact geographic format. So to make them compatible with other geographical data or WGS84 kind of data, you need to convert MODIS HTA file to WGS84. And you also may want to convert HTA to GeoTIFF for easy uh, handling, especially by WIC also. And so because of that, you need to use this MODIS reprojection tool. Um, as we will show later, it's easy to install and use tool, but it helps convert MODIS file easily to usable form. There's also a new tool coming up, has come out now. It is called Hedge Tool, and it does exactly the same things as um, converting MODIS prod, um, product format. And here is the site where you can download and install uh, MODIS MRT tool. So finally, we come to elevation data from shuttle radar topography mission. So here is, again, a link where a lot of details can be found about um, SRTM elevation data and other elevation data as well. Uh, but the brief description is that in 2000, um, Space Shuttle Endeavour carried a C-band radar. Um, and based on interferometry using this radar, about 116 orbits around Earth for 11 days were collected. And based on the radar waves transmitted and received, by analyzing them, elevation was put together. Um, and so these data are now available at 30 meter resolution. That's the native resolution. This is the site where these data come from. It is GTAX uh, site. 
these are static data for the WIG model. You get them for your region once, and then you can just specify them uh, at appropriate place. Um, GDAX, you can go and get tiles uh, of uh, SRTM elevation uh, by defining box or country. Uh, you can download data after you select uh, data type and data location. Uh, so this is a quick way of getting data. This is also a very useful site um, for elevation data. This is the Consultative Group for International Agricultural Research Consortium and Special Information. They have 30 meters and 90 meters resolution SRTM data. But more importantly, they have 250 meter composite elevation data from SRTM. That's a new data set, but this is what we are going to use because WIC model resolution anyway is going to be three kilometer or higher, so it's lower than that. So this is good enough resolution. So this is the data we recommend that you use for WIC model input. And with that, we, I will take like a minute and show some demonstration video of how to get these data. So this is, the, this is what we're going to do. We'll start with MERA2 and iMERGE data from Chestis. This is the address. Um, we will also see how to get precipitation climatology from using a tool called Giovanni. And this is, we need this to specify uh, initial moisture condition. We will then see how to get MODIS data. And then just we have, for completeness, we have these sites here where you get SRTM and uh, HWSD soil data, which are static data for WIG model. So these are all global data. So it helps uh, to use these tools to subset it before you download for your own region. In this case, we're going to focus on the Mekong Basin. So we're going to start with the MERA2 data access. This is the MERA2 project page and data access link, which you will get from the slide that we just saw. On the data access, there is the MDISC link. This gets you to the JustDisk um, site. Here is where all the MERA data are available, different as we saw, there are many different groups. So this is the ASM group that we will use for wind parameters. Uh, and this is two-dimensional data because we need surface, near surface wind. Once you click on that file, it will give you information about MERA2. It has documentation of the data, test data citation, and all the information that you need for the data. Format is NetCDF4. It has global coverage. It started in 1980. And global data are 190 megabytes per file. Uh, special and temporal resolution is given here. And notice that it is hourly data. This is assimilated data. So we don't want global data. We want it for Mekong Basin. So we're going to use the subsetter. Once you go to the subsetter, You'll see a map. You can either draw a rectangle of the area of your interest, but we are going to give specific latitude longitude box that you can enter up above here. And that is because we want to get precipitation data, modis data from, for the same box. So we just are going to have a approximate latitude longitude given here for Mekong Basin. And this shows the box where the data will be collected or extracted. Then temporal selection, we're going to use for 2016 January to 2017 September, because we're going to do July-August uh, case study um, in 2017. And as we saw earlier, as Kale said, this needs this model needs one year of spinning up time. So before actual 
you need about one year of data. So we have so many files here. We will pick two meter east wind and north wind, so zonal and meridional wind components. And here, remember these are hourly data. So we are going to pick a mean which performs daily mean. You can also pick specific time period to mean, but we are going to use daily mean. And then there's a regrading option that we're not using now. We are keeping at the original resolution. And the output file format is NetCDF4, which is the default. Once you pick and search for the data, um, you will get subsetted data in different files. So this is for January 2016 um, and so on. These are subsetted NetCDF4. You can click on each file, but basically for batch download or bulk download, you can use WGET or Unix curl as shown up here. We use WGET. What you can do is click on this, all the URL, um, and these are all the files that were extracted from Mera. Once you, and you save them in a file called my file or any other file and then follow through the steps shown here and then use wget with the file you saved with the urls once you do that you can save all the data on your your computer for week input once you have gone through this and downloaded win data now you can go back and download temperature data from Mera 2 as well. We knew earlier that we need single level data for temperatures. And so we are going to search for single level data. And here it is two dimensional single level data that provides near surface temperatures. You click on that and you go through the same procedure. You have all the data information resolution, but these are daily data. Winds were hourly data, these are daily data. You are going to subset just the same for the Mekong region as we did for the UNV wind. And now we're going to pick the same time period, 2016, January to September 2017. This is just to make sure that we have enough data to spin up the model before our actual case. Most importantly, here are the parameters. Maximum and mi minimum two meter temperature. And you can go through the same procedure. You will start search. You will get all the files. And then you can just use the wget to get the file. So, Part of the meteorological forcing is winds and temperatures. We got that. Now it is the precipitation part. We are searching for iMERGE. This is the GPM multi-satellite product. You can also get to this by going through what we saw in the presentation to GPM site. And it brings you to the same um, Carter disk site where you can get iMERGE data right here. So there are multiple ways to get to this location. Notice here that you will need to log in uh, to download the data. Um, and we will see towards the end of this um, session how where to go to register for this uh, to get the login, data, uh, login information. So again, these are iMERGE data, which we saw they are early, late, and final. You can also see the different temporal resolutions from day, lower on, they were like half hourly. Um, these are all, we're going to pick um, version five daily data. Data start in 2014, but uh, as you can see, these are one-tenth of a degree. And again, you're going to, subset the data for Mekong Basin. This is slightly different, but you basically you provide temporal and special information. This is the Mekong 
box that we selected earlier. Note here that for high merge, it requires different format in the sense for MERA, it is longitude and latitude format. This is latitude and longitude format. So they are reversed here. So it's same numbers, but now here latitude goes first. So this, these are some of the details that it helps to, to keep in mind when you download and extract data. And similarly, when you search the data, this is you can subset select data. There are some more steps than MERA, but basically you are going to get the uh, data. Here it says that there are six variables. When you click there to get the details uh, of this data, you will see that there are multiple parameters. So we want calibrated precipitation. This is the final gauge calibrated precipitation. High quality precipitation is something that is just from satellite. Precipitation calibrated is uh, calibrated with gauge. So we are going to use that and subset that for Mekong Basin, which will go as input to our WIC model. So now you can see that uh, once the process is complete, you can get daily calibrated precipitation for all the days that you requested. You can get the list of URL and then download using WCAD just as we saw in case, case of NERA. So this is a um, way to get all the meteorological forcing data. So notice this is NASA Earth's data page. Uh, here is where you will get MODIS land cover, LAI, and albedo data. You can click on this Find Data button. If you have not used Earth's data before, we recommend that you take a tour here. There is a tour that guides you through the features. Otherwise, you can just go to Data Search. In here, we are typing the MODIS product name, NCD12Q1. It appears right there. Once you click on that, it tells you all the, uh, and you can notice the file name. Once you do that, you now we are going to pick special domain using rectangular Mekong domain. Again, it's the same let lawn that we're using. This is the southwest corner and northeast corner. So same let lawn, but they're provided in different formats for different data, different sequence. Here is the temporal selection. And we're going to pick uh, 2016 and 17 uh, um, for simulation. But the land data, land cover data, are available um, only to 2013 and 14. So that's the land cover we are going to use. And since we these are annual data, we need so we can specify all the years. It is going to get us the latest annual land cover available from MODIS. Once you apply the filter, it shows you how all these tiles where the data are available. These are the tiles. And all the list granules appear um, below. When you highlight, it shows which, which file it is down below here. Once you have the file you need, these are start date and end date for each granule. These are the file names. It's a horizontal and vertical tile information. And once you do that, you can download the data with using that download button. It requires Earth data login. So you need to register for Earth data. 
This information is available at the end of the session, how to register for our data. Once you, once you log in and try to download the data, it tells you what's the memory required, how many granules, and then there are two options, either direct download or there is um, stage for delivery. Stage for delivery is that it, it tells you via email that your order is ready and you can um, download. If you want to download directly, then you have download links where you can just click on each of the file and save on your computer. Or you can have uh, download links to the file. You can save these URLs and use something like wget uh, to download this data on your computer. There is download access script also available from the same uh, location. And as it says, it, it requires a Unix uh, machine, but you can download the data on any machine. The script is for the Unix. So this is also you see that it's 500, meti 500 meters sinusoidal grid. This is equal area grid. And so later on, we will see how to convert this data into geographic um, format. Once you have the land cover data, you can go back and use the same um, special and uh, configuration or selection for getting LAI, which is 15A2. Here is you have 500 millimeter and there is one kilometer LAI. We are going to pick deep area index, which is one kilometer. And you can select that. It shows all the tiles available in the Mekong Basin. And this we are actually going to use for 2016 and 2017 monthly data. You can average it over all the months, all the way from 2000 if you want a climatology. But there is also an option that you just use the week period uh, that you have. Another way to do is form a climatology of LAI and albedo and keep it as a static data for your region. And then you can use it again and again. So here we just showing that different years are there, but we're going to pick 2016 and 17 for now. These data are um, available eight days. So there are multiple um, data per month, so at least uh, three or four. And so for entire year, you will have many more timestamps. So preprocessor requires that you take LAI data and then form monthly mean data and average over all years. So for one January, you will add all January from 2016 and 17 year, or if you want to form a climatology, you take everything and form a climatology. Again, you go through the same download button, but here there is one more option. It's called Customize Product. This allows you to convert to GeoTIFF, and it provides projection in geographic or other two, but we are going to pick geographic. This is WGS84. So for LAI, you can go directly to the download option and customize to convert it and then just one kilometer LAI is what we need. All other parameters you can exclude. For weak input, it is the LAI one kilometer that is important. And then again, once you submit that, it will pre-process, convert the format, and then you will receive an email to um, get the data. You can just download it on your computer at that point.
you will also be doing the same for shortwave albedo. So we looked at Modi's land cover, Modi's LAI, and now the same thing is true for Modi's albedo. Everything is the same. Only thing that you change is that you use product 43A3, that's the shortwave albedo. Once you do that, you will get all the granules and you can just go through the same process. You will be able to convert albedo into geotiff and also uh, into geographic format as well. And this just basically are the same steps of time selection. And it shows um, how to customize and change the format and get the shortwave albedo as well. So using Earth data, you will actually go through the um, steps to get MODIS data. Notice that in the albedo, you will have number of options. You are going to use this short, uh, um, short wave albedo for um, black sky. That's what you are going to use for weak input. And then you will submit uh, your order and receive an email to get the data back. This brings us to the end of this MODIS data. OK, so we saw MERA and uh, iMERGE and MODIS data. Um, one last thing that I, I want to show is use this MODIS reprojection tool. Uh, this, is, this can be downloaded from Land Process and Distributed Archive Center, or LPDAC. You require Earth data login here, too. Once you log in, you can download MRT tool for your uh, operating system. It can work on multiple machines. There are detailed manuals and notes given about this. And once you install it on your computer, you can process land cover file that you downloaded from Earth data. This is the MODIS web tool. Uh, the reproduction tool, you can pick the file that you saved on your computer uh, by, that came from Arc Data. Uh, this is the HDF file. This is just an example of a particular tile. And you can, this is, this is in HDF format. Now you can use the same file, but now you can pick, this is, the same file, but you can pick the output to be geotiff. And that, con that changes uh, that format. You can resample, but more importantly, you can choose geographic projection type. And you can choose, as you can see here, you can choose um, WGS84 data type. And once you have all these parameters, you are going to pick IGBP land cover, which is type 1. There are other schemes as well, derived by different groups. But we're going to use the I, uh, IGBP. So you are going to just convert that one band. This actually shows the tile that you're working with. Once you convert, you could say convert uh, format, you will see a little window with the processing, and you will get data which are in TIFF format and which are uh, converted to um, geographic format. So this is one extra step for MODIS land cover that you need. I also want to point out that now on Google Earth Engine, uh, there is a way to get reprojected deep images from MODIS land cover, LAI, albedo. It's a little uh, learning there too. You need scripts to process data, but you know, so this is a um, simple way to get data and 
boss them by yourselves. Now, the last um, demonstration here is that to use Giovanni to get precipitation climatology. This is the Giovanni web page, which allows you to search and analyze data. Since we want annual climatology, um, here's the website. First, we go through that. You can see there are different analysis options, such as maps, vertical profile, time series, other miscellaneous um, analysis, such as histogram. Um, you search data in this keyword box. We are going to use iMerge Final, the one that we use for WIC input. Once you pick the data and search, we provide options with all that data. We're going to pick latest version with monthly resolution. Okay. So all the information and units are given here. We're going to use version 5, which is the latest final run, which uses rain gauge calibration. There is version 4 as well, but always it's good to pick latest version. And we are going to use two year here, entire year, 2015 and 2016, January to December. So this is two year mean data, and we are going to have a special selection. You can draw a box, or another way in Giovanni is that you can choose the shape file. You can choose the watershed, click there, and then you can type Mekong, and it says Mekong watershed. You click on that, and it automatically picks the domain for you so that you will have this annual climatology for Mekong Basin. Once you do that, you can plot the data. And what it does is plots the data, and it provides a link to download the data. Here is the map of the annual mean data from iMERGE. It's the color scale. And on left-hand side, there is there's millimeter per hour. So if you need to convert units, you need to keep that in mind. If you're not millimeter per day, millimeter per month, or total, that depends. Here's where you will download the data in NetCDF format. So this is annual climate logic from iMERGE based on 2015 and 16. And you can save this NetCDF file on your computer. Once you save that, uh, you can provide that as input to the WIC model, and initial soil uh, moisture condition will be derived from this data. So we went through all the input data, and here are the two um, sites where you can get SRTM and HWST data. So there are dynamic data sets, and then there are static data sets that you can uh, obtain for WIC inputs. Most importantly, you can see here is the NASA Earth Data User Registration uh, site provided here. Uh, once you go in there, it, the data are all completely free, but it requires registration. You just give your username, and uh, it, it approves you as a user. And that is the username you will use for Earth data for GSTs and also for LPDAC. Everywhere it's the same login that will work. Okay. So this brings us to the end of this session. But before that, I want we want to go over some of the challenges that we saw with big uh, inputs coming from remote sensing observations. We saw that there are various input data. They come from different sources and locations. Um, they all have different special resolution and different formats. Um, so we went through three different websites to get the data. Um, they, and then it requ the, like WIC requires data on the same grids, uh, same resolution. 
So these data will have to be regridded for WIC to, to use them uh, for the input. So there is some pre-processing there. Uh, WIC requires data at specific temporal resolution as well, either daily or sub-daily. Um, and so that has to be uh, taken care of in pre-processing. It requires minimum of one year of spin-up time, so you need at least a year worth data and then all the way up to the case study that you are looking at. Or if you are doing it in near real time, then also you have to have a uh, run that is spun up and then you then feed near real time information to the model. So the data have to be rearranged. All these are raster forms, which has like maps, latitude, longitude maps. But WIC requires that for each grid point, each latitude, longitude, you have entire time series of data. And next week, Kale is going to walk us through that, how to do that. But that also is a major reformatting of all the input data. And so there is extensive pre-processing and computer programming is required. You need scripts to manipulate data, change the format. So not only it, it, NASA websites have made it easy to, to extract um, domain and extract temporally and save it in specific format, but even then there is more pre-processing needed before you can inject this data into um, big model. But at the same time, there are quite a few advantages of using these data. First of all, if you were to use um, just surface data, they can be not uniform. They may not, not be complete. Look at the Mekong Basin. It is quite big. And if you just have a few surface uh, station data, that would not be representative of the entire basin. So. Remote sensing provides specially continuous data. It's gridded already. Um, and it is important for estimating accurate water budget components because you have a good spatial and temporal coverage of data or observations. Where there are no, there are data void regions, uh, you, so remote sensing is very useful. That's where they provide real information. Uh, so the data are available directly from satellite observations or also from Earth system models in which data are assimilated. So either way, you can get continuous gridded data. Uh, these are all open source data. They're available historically. Uh, most of them um, are long term, more than a decade long. And they're also available in, in near real time. So you can use these data along with WIC model to do either weather-related study or climate-related study. And you have web-based tools for special and temporal subsetting, format conversion. So half of the work is done already uh, online when you download the data. And then uh, trainings about these data, data access, they're available from RSET. Um, so that also, that the reference uh, presentations and recordings are always there that you can go back and review how to get data. So with that, we will end today's session. Um, I know it was a little longer session with a lot of information, but it also provides you a um, flavor of what is included or what is involved in running a hydrologic model. Um, model itself is given to us, but the preparation for running the model requires quite a few steps. Um, and so next week, what we're going to do is take all these input data, and we have run the model with this data. And so we're going to, what Kale is going to show is show how to implement this data into the model. And then he will also show some of the results from different case studies um, that we have using WIC models. So with that, um, we end today's session. Thank you so very much for attending. Um, and uh, if you have any question, answer, please use the chat box to enter the question answer. Thank you. So here are some of the questions that we've tried to answer. And then we'll go to some more questions. One of the questions was input data, uh, should they all be in raster format? 
And Kel, you can jump in any time um, to join the QA. So yes, they're all required um, in raster format. Uh, it, that they have to be raster in the sense that at each grid point, you have to have um, input. So WIC is a grid-based model. So for each grid point, when you need data, you need uh, raster data. They don't have to be in raster format for running because you will be making time series at each grid point, as we briefly talked in this session, and also as Kale will talk more about it next week. Yeah, um, real quick, Amita, one comment on that is if you do have gauge data for um, for your meteorological information. Uh, then typically you do an interpolation to convert it into a uh, raster format. Yes, thanks. That's useful. So what is sub-daily data? So sub-daily data are data within a day. So they could be hourly or three-hourly or six-hourly data. And for energy balance, we require this because solar radiation reaching at the surface changes during the day due to do solar angle. Um, so that is represented when you use sub daily data. Um, so is there a video how to install exactly in Linux using commands? So Kel, are we going to do that next week or? Um, yeah, so I can, I wasn't planning to do the, the install of the VIC, but I'll add in a, uh, a small section on that. That's great. Thank you. So why get elevation data from satellite? Isn't it static data? And yes, it is static data. We specify it once for the watershed or river basin that you're using. Uh, we're using uh, shuttle radar topography missions from the data was collected in from space shuttle radar. And uh, it helps because it's continuous special data and is available in different resolutions starting from 30 meters all the way to 250 meters, as we saw in the presentation. Will you provide Python or R to download, process, and extract data? So um, there are Python scripts that Kale will mention next week. They're mostly for pre-processing downloaded data. So today's presentation was to show you how to get to the data, how to download the data. So that's first step. And then you then convert uh, those data into WIC input format. But for downloading data, you really will have to go through some of the steps that we showed today. So go to different NASA websites and download different data sets. So uh, we had a demo about how to get vegetation data for different river basins. We did this for Mekong Basin, but you can give subset for your own region. Uh, you saw in Earth's data where we provide latitude and longitude for the river basin, approximately covering the river basin. And you can do the same thing for your own region. Um, Earth engine, uh, not yet, but that that would be terrible, I'm sure. Yeah. So, quick note on that. Um, you know, I, I did talk to uh, some of the developers for Earth Engine, and the way that it's set up, um, it's not very nice. It doesn't play very well with hydrology models. Um, so if we do link VIC model with Earth Engine, it would be it would have to be some sort of like uh, linkages between getting the data on Earth Engine, running the model, and then pushing that back to Earth Engine. So yes, some of the data, such as MODIS data, are available in Google Earth Engine. So that that is the way to do it, as Kel said. Preparing data for input 
on Google Earth Engine, then run the model and push the results back to view it on. on G. Uh, SRDM, you can get 30 meter data from, but so CGIAR, it does not have 30 meter data, has 90 meter data. And in the presentation, there was a slide about GDAX, Global Data Exploration, and that has 30 meter resolution data. So if you want that, you can get it from GDAX. We are using CGIAR because uh, WIC cannot be run at very high resolution like 30 meter and 250 meter data are directly available from CGIR which we can inject into RIC. So that's why for convenience we used 250 meter data. So Kel, this is a good question actually. If you have relatively flat watershed, would higher resolution DM help? Um, yeah, that's a that's a great question, and really that depends on the accuracy of the DEM. So, uh, from my experiences, SRTM uh, has pretty large errors. Um, it can be on the order of 30 meters as like a maximum. Um, and so, if you have like really flat uh, floodplains, then your error that you're getting with the SRT like high resolution SRTM data can actually inhibit or you know introduce errors into your analysis. And so um, we see this quite often in the floodplains in the Mekong Basin, for example. Um, so it, that really depends on the accuracy of your DEM. Um, and I would caution before, um, I would caution like using just the highest resolution DEM and, and assuming it's the most accurate because that may not be the case. a very good question. Uh, what's the minimum size of watershed that you that we can be used at? So Kel, I, I know that resolution limit is three kilometer, but you would need minimum amount of grid points to represent a floodplain, right? Yeah, so I mean, I would suggest that it's uh, What's the size? I, I I can't think of a size off the top of my head. <laughs> I I um, you, but you yeah. would say four grid points, right? Yeah, you but would need least, a couple of grid points. Yeah, so I would say about twelve kilometer would be the limit of watershed. Yeah. Right? Yeah, and I'll show I'll show this in the next session. But like when you when we set up like the routing scheme. We're actually going to take into account like fractional uh, coverage of a watershed. So even if you do have like watershed that covers only a few pixels, then the model will still account for that. So um, we'll, yeah, you need at least a couple of good cells. So I would uh, make sure that you don't do it for like very small sub watersheds. Yeah, so question 12, um, you know, three kilometer resolution, uh, resolution or limit is based on the model physics. So the, the assumption that vertical fluxes of water are much larger than the horizontal fluxes, that assumption holds at um, grids which are about three kilometers or higher. That's why that's the limit. Yeah, and so when you're setting up your model to like defining which grid cell size you should run, so what I typically do is define the, the size of the precipitation data inputs. So for example, uh, we have an iMERGE data set, which is 0.1 degree resolution, then we can set it up at the model at 0.1 degree resolution. Um, and, and in that case, so how the precipitation data is interpreted as is aerial average uh, precipitation for that one pixel. And so th then that 
is directly relatable to that how the VIC model needs uh, precipitation data inputs. Um, and so, for example, if you set up the model at three degree resolution, and then you run the model using iMerge or what have you, you're still going to get that same kind of result. Um, so think of it as like a nearest neighbor kind of interpolation uh, for that precipitation because you're not you're not really adding in more spatial information from that precipitation. If that makes any sense. Yeah, so if you're also limited by your input information, you can interpolate it, but still you are not adding in information. Uh, there is a question here, is it possible to acquire wind and temperature input variables in near real time for operational purposes? So, um, yes, there are analysis. They provide near real time data, uh, NOAA and ECMWF. We do that. Um, and also you can use forecast model so that you can, you have data when you need it. But yes, there are near real-time analysis. There is still some latency in, in that data will be on the website and And then you download and prepare. Okay, question 14 is your domain. Okay. We have okay. five kilometers dam. Yeah. Oh, sorry. You go ahead. <laughs> yeah. No, no. You go ahead. Question 14. Okay. So uh, just repeating the question. If you have a five kilometer DEM, what is the optimal elevation band file, land cover vegetation parameter file, or vegetation library spatial resolution to resolve properly most of the physical processes in the watershed? Um, so if you have a five kilometer DEM, um, then that, that's fairly coarse resolution. I would probably scale up the um, your grid cell size to probably 0.25 degrees or greater, uh, because the five. I mean, you're not getting much variation in the in those elevation bands if you're going much lower than 0.25 degrees. Um, you know, if you do want to capture like model physics or um, small scale model physics, then you'll probably want to input in higher resolution data. Um, like five kilometer DEM sounds like a global application to me. Okay, question 15. What if the spatial variability in soil data is not present for the river basin? You can consider that these are one soil type present. Um, then the VIC model is acceptable in this case. Um, yes, so that that is acceptable. So um, we'll see next week too, like when we calibrate uh, the model, uh, that the model, um, it's assumed that the calibrated parameters are lumped parameters. And what I mean by lumped is that they're um, they are the same for each sub-watershed. Um, and so if that's the case, then you have a, sm a small sub-watershed and you don't have the uh, soil data needed for that sub-watershed, then you can consider it lumped. Uh, but the VIC model uh, still runs on a grid basis. You're just assigning each grid the same. Uh, the same soil properties. Okay. So, yeah. Go ahead, Anita. Is why take LAI at one kilometer resolution when we cannot be done at that resolution or minimum is three kilometer? Um, that is because LAI is available at one kilometer resolution. So the best thing would be to just get the data at that resolution and then change it to the grid resolution 
something that you are using. The resolution really is available. As you just as you know, for land cover, we use 500, 500 meters because that's the native resolution for that. And the next question is related that what do you choose for output pixel size and Moody's reprojection tool? You can do um, averaging here. So you can say that, OK, if it is one kilometer, you want a three kilometer pixel in there uh, from Moody's reprojection tool. But um, we decided that we, we, you don't, if you don't specify output pixel size, then it keeps the native resolution. So in LAI case, it would be one kilometer for vegetation would be 500 meters. So then we can just convert it to quick. You can uh, regrid it, but we decided not to do that because we're going to use a script to put everything on quick resolution, and that that's next. Okay, so um, thank you for answering question 17 uh, as well, Amita. So we're going to jump to question 18. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to refer any books regarding VIC? Um, so to the extent of my knowledge, um, I haven't seen any books on the VIC model. Um, there are some books just on general hydrologic modeling. Um, but also, we can provide, um, so the University of Washington has done a really good job of um, capturing or, I guess, cataloging all of the journal articles um, that have used VIC, like basically um, journal articles on the model physics and then also uh, journal articles on application. And so we can point you to that, um, to that link so that way you can refer to those and, and learn more about it. So uh, next question is about why do we only choose monthly image product? We didn't. We chose daily uh, product, actually. We chose daily image product for big simulation. The only place where we chose monthly image was to create annual climatology. Uh, and that is, to, that, that is used for deriving initial soil moisture conditions. So that's the only place where we use monthly information because anyway we are going to average it over the like, annual time scale. Yeah, the question 20, does Giovanni has only main watershed uh, worldwide? That is true. If you go to Giovanni and click on the on the list of all the watersheds and river basin, you will see the whole list. There are many, many uh, river basins available. What is the spin-up time and warm-up time? Yes. Um, so okay, you can add to this, but spin-up time is something where model parameters, they come into balance first. Because when you start it from rest, when you, there, because of uh, computational truncation and because of the model uh, coding, it, it takes a while for model to get into a balance or uh, well calibrated, I don't want to say calibrated, but it, what, what's the word cal? It should be in a form where it is all the processes are in balance. Or, and then uh, after that, you can trust uh, what model provides as output. Yeah, so basically adding, in, adding to that. So when you initialize your model, you unless you have initial state information, um, and what I mean by state information, like um, you know, snow water equivalent, um, soil moisture, all those kind of variables that would affect the processes that are going on. Um, if you don't have accurate information on that, then your model, um, your simulations will actually give you poor results. And so, like Amita said, you run the model for a certain time period using actual data. And then it's assumed that you know after a certain time period, your model stabilizes, the state stabilizes, and then you can have more accurate results or have more confidence in your results um, after a certain time period. 
and typically we use uh, with Vic, um, you know, I use one year, and that's probably the minimum uh, spin up time. Uh, but there are studies that looked at different spin up times for different models, and like one year is probably a, a good starting point on that. Okay, so. Question 22 for data with resolution less than 250 meters. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong, I think they do have a global Landsat yes. uh, data set that's at 30 meters? Yes. Yeah, but that's not continuously updated. Right. Um, and then if you want higher resolution accurate land cover maps, then I would suggest making your own. <laughs> um, so those um, and that way you can have like full confidence and understand the caveats that it, uh, with your land cover map. But, um, you know, in this case, you know, for large scale and, and global applications, we use the, uh, the global data sets. Okay, so question 23, it would be interesting study Oh, I would be interested in studying relationship between vegetation and surface processes or surface more soil pro, uh, processes to analyze extreme events uh, in the VIC energy mode. How much information in terms of spatial scale would be necessary to take into account to prepare data uh, to perform like or to represent these uh, processes? So that's a, that's a really good question. And um, there's currently research going on that, um, that are looking into that. So I imagine at smaller spatial scales, your land cover uh, variations are going to have more effect on your hydrologic processes. And what I mean by that is if you have a small watershed and you have, say, land cover change, like 50% of the forests are gone, then you're losing a lot of those small scale changes that are occurring in that small watershed. And there's not much precipitation. Um, there's, there's little water and what little water or the um, fluxes of that water that occur in that basin would be higher relative to the inputs of the water. Uh, versus, say, Mekong Basin or the Amazon Basin, which is a massive basin, and you have a lot of water coming into it. And so at that point, you know, spatial scale of land cover um, doesn't necessarily have that large of an effect on your uh, results. So it, it would really depend on um, the scale that you're looking at. Um, and this is an ongoing research topic. So. It'd be uh, it'd be really good if you figure out what's uh, you know what the answer is to that, and then publish it, and then we can refer to that. Yeah. So uh, next question also is a good question because energy balance mode does work. I mean, even if you give daily data, but uh, I believe right, okay. Yeah, so the model will work at, um, like it doesn't say you can't run it with a 24 hour time step, but um, the, the reason why, you, you, I wouldn't trust those results because at that point you're not really, um, the 24 hour time step, how it actually resolves your energy balance is based on, uh, it assumes when your minimum temperature occurs in the day and it assumes when your maximum temperature occurs in the day. And then your energy balance, you're actually trying to get those net energy uh, fluxes throughout the day. So if you have solar radiation coming in and you have your long wave radiation going out, you know, what is your net balance on that? When is that occurring? How is that affecting the timing of um, when your precipitation is occurring or anything like that, right? Because those all like fine scale, um, I mean, think about it. If you have, if you have, you know, rain in the morning and then it heat and then it stops raining, it heats up. Then you have like very moist atmosphere, 
and then that also affects energy balance, right? But if you're running those simulations on a daily time step, you're just kind of getting daily average information, and then that's not actually capturing those um, those fine scale temporal uh, relationships between water and energy. So in short, yes, you can run on 24 hour time step an energy balance mode, but I would not trust those results. Okay, so question 25. Most people use PC or Windows. <laughs> Does that mean we have to install Linux to run Vic, or is there a workaround to running on Windows? Um, so what I've seen is people install virtual machines on uh, their Windows mach machine. And so what I mean by that is you basically part or um, there's software to do this for you um, where you just load a Linux operating system in a contained virtual environment. So you're not actually, or you're running Linux, but you're still on your Windows PC. Or there's a program called SigWin, uh, which is a Linux emulator. And so it basically, um, you, you're able to run a Linux environment in Windows. And then also in Windows 10, there is a uh, beta development uh, where you can actually run Linux natively in the Windows command line. But again, that is in beta testing. So there are workarounds I would, I would explore looking into those options. Um, so the nec next question is about about using uh, GFDS runoff to calibrate with hydrology model. Is that what you're asking? I'm not sure about the questions. So GFDS, I believe, uses microwave satellite data to come up with runoff or surface inundation. Um, and so if they also use a water balance model. So you can compare how GFDS uh, gives runoff and what runoff you get from WIC. But I'm not sure whether you can use one to calibrate another. I'm not too sure because GFDS also uses a water balance model, if I if I recall correctly. So so again, you are comparing model with model, both driven by uh, observed input. Yeah, so I'm, I'm looking through the, the questions that you guys are entering. I think we missed some questions here. Um, so I'm just going through some of these here. Um, so is the VIC model open source? And the answer to that is yes. Um, you can directly download the source code, alter the source code to your needs. Uh, so that's available to you. It's free as well. Um, and then question, there's another question here. Uh, how does the VIC model handle backwater effects with the routing routine? Um, the short answer to that is it doesn't. Uh, so uh, the routing scheme assumes that your horizontal flows in one direction. Um, and so that, um, so we see this quite a, uh, quite a bit in like floodplains where you're, the water doesn't move where you'd expect the water to move. Like it just, you know, um, you have the, these channel, not channel reversals, but you know, like you're saying, the backwater effects and it just assumes that, uh, so how the routing model, and we'll see a little bit tomorrow, but how the routing model works is you have a flow direction. And, um, and the flow direction is what you say contributes to this basin outlet. Um, and so 
if you have, um, so I guess it depends on the accuracy of your elevation data set, but if all the, if you're assuming all the pixels flow into this uh, one outlet, then it assumes, or then all that water at each time step always flows to that outlet. There's no like um, flowing up to another um, cell, which doesn't occur very often. Hope that answered your question. Uh, there's another question here. How how can we get the question and answer sheet? So I think we're going to share that afterwards, right, Amita? Yeah, that is true. We will be posting um, this document where answers are posted. Yeah. Yeah. So um, there's a question here on email addresses. So uh, our email addresses are in this question and answer document, um, and so when we share this, you guys will have access to our emails. Will the training next week show how to install the WIC for those with Windows? <laughs> you uh, know, a virtual machine, so. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, because yeah, people, if that's the case, sorry. I mean, oh, sorry, I was yeah, going to say. Up, but, you know, this is beyond, this is more like introductory webinar that you actually just get to know what is involved. If you are interested in more detailed training, then you can request that through our uh, web page. Uh, it's beyond the scope of going through each and every step, especially to how to install this on different operating system. And that because it's like case by case, uh, what kind of machine you have, what kind of resources you have. So uh, would be beyond the scope of this particular webinar series. I mean, you, you can get information that, uh, you know, where to get virtual machine box, and but installation is something that you will go through on your own. Or if you need more help, you can request a training. Okay, so I see one last question here. Um, can we use gray satellite after each storm event? Um, and so from my understanding, I don't think we can use GRACE to calibrate. So how the VIC model works in particular is you have, um, you know, it, it only solves the, um, the moisture fluxes near surface. And so GRACE actually captures everything. And so uh, all water. So what I mean by that is surface storage, subsurface storage, and also deep groundwater storage. And so in that part, um, with GRACE, you have those terms, those three terms, and then typically um, how they get to groundwater storage or like, uh, you know, separate those terms out is actually using the hydrologic model. So you do the hydrologic model simulations without using GRACE, and then you separate those terms with GRACE out. Um, and so what GRACE is used for, though, is actually assimilating into the model. Uh, so, you, so that way, when you're modeling these, these different components of the hydrologic cycle, you use the GRACE observations to check your model, like how the model's doing along the way. And then if the model is not agreeing with the GRACE observations, then uh, this data assimilation technique actually um, adjust the model state to make it look more like the observations. So I would caution against using it to calibrate, but it is used for uh, data assimilation. Okay, so one last question, Amita. I think we'll... we'll uh, be done. So the question is, where can we post offline questions? Is there a method to do that for now? Uh, you can email uh, questions to us. Um, right now, we, we cannot post uh, anywhere, but you can send email to either our set email address or to Kel or me. Yeah. Yeah, we can we can add those into this document too. Mm -hmm. and, yes. 
and answer those in here. Okay, so I, I think this concludes our session number two. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for attending. And um, you know, I know we went over a little bit, but that's all right. It seems like everybody's interested and you know, a lot of good questions. So uh, hopefully, you know, next session or session three, we're going to go over uh, the model. So, uh, or like actually, like I'll show videos on how to do the, um, set up the model um, using the data that Amita uh, talked about today. And so, um, so we'll go through, um, set up the model, we'll, we'll install the model, set up the model, and then uh, we will talk about calibrations and then specific applications. of the model. So, okay. Again, thank you for attending today's session, and we look forward to seeing you next week, uh, same time. Thank you.